Welcome back to Be Great Economics. I'm Nate. Let's get started. Okay, so weekly update. Today is the 18th of January. Um, obviously, uh, there has been some turmoil in the markets. Now, we had Monday off due to MLK Day uh, for stocks, so we didn't get to see a reaction until recently now. I have the uh, SPY ETF for the S&P 500, and uh, I was bringing up this potential Wyckoff distribution uh, that uh, clearly played out here. We are we are down here now. We can't necessarily say that we're done with the distribution on the S&P. And I can pull up the SPX. Uh, I think I had the distribution on here. No, we'll go back to the we'll go back to the um, the SPY. I had it on here before, so my apologies. But uh, you can see that there is a breakdown from a very very long term trend support. Uh, we got all these touches along this way. Uh, we've kind of held this up. Um, this isn't too unnerving just yet, uh, but it is going to start triggering some people as they saw it gap down. You can see the gap here. Missed that Monday, had that long weekend, and it, uh, it really added some momentum and spice to this game. Um, a lot of people said a lot of markets were generally flat. It's like, yeah, but the big caps that were the last thing sustaining the market are starting to uh, give in. Um, we will look at the VIX and the volatility obviously ticked up, but it hasn't necessarily gone back to what we had back in December. Um, now that doesn't mean that we can't, but we do have this long-term resistance that we broke before, but a testing breaking it uh, and then setting above it could send us really parabolic, really fast. Um, this is more just a reflection of the type of volatility people are expecting. Let's go to the NASDAQ and we can see that our uh, distribution did play out. We are breaking down below the lines. The risk assets basically are selling off faster. And I can go to the NDX. We saw that the volume obviously rose into selling here, which is what we wanted to see in a distribution. Now, I had my point count slightly off, and I said this last week that this may be actually sooner. This may be the buying climax range. This may be the secondary test, right? Like we just had a different chart going. And I can, boom, look at that. So we have we have the uh, we have this uh, zone here that's the last points of support giving up and that's happening right here. Now that you've uh, obviously if you see my video on the Nasdaq and the bubble, I, I very much think that this is the most overvalued and highest risk uh, place to be because it's tech conglomerate. Um, so it has been bleeding the most. So where are our price targets? Well, we've got a little bit of one right here. Um, at 14,469, and I had them better on the. Well, we'll look at it here. Um, these kind of logical lines of support, these sensible areas in here. It's either here or here, where we're going to meet a lot of confluence. Uh, we'll go to the. We'll go to the QQQ because I had a better version on there. Um, we have an area where we're going to hit a lot of confluence here, but if we break down below this line, we're going to get a real fast fear panic. So we could get some type of dead cat bounce out of here, but price targets, uh, like I said, with the point and figure that I showed before, the point and figure measure, uh, since we've checked all these boxes, would send us to uh, the 351 on the QQQ and then potentially to the 317. Now, further than that, does not match the point and figure anymore, and we are just into bear market territory. Now, if you've seen some of my macro conversations about the NASDAQ and the S&P 500, you can tell that I am still net long-term or middle-term, I guess, uh, bullish. I think that this is an acute, we're not gonna end this combination in a distribution. I think that the market is trying to figure out if it wants to go into risk assets. And I think quite frankly, they're gonna get it. They're gonna go there because we have high inflation. And even though the rates are, we're fearing are going to go up, rates go up and then so does the market when they go up. It's when they peak is when you have a risk point where we're overextended and the risk is too high and the market can't handle more. Where is the threshold for this risk? It's probably somewhere around above 2% interest rates, but it's realistically closer to 3% uh, like long, long bond yields like the 10 year. So <clears throat> we'll go back to daily. Um, obviously risk off assets had a little bit of a bloody day, how, or risk on assets had a bit of a bloody day and we're seeing a rotation into value, but Bitcoin kind of held up surprisingly, and this goes generally in line with my uh, Bitcoin cares more about being a money than it does a speculative asset. I think most of this line here, the further we're getting from this upward trend line, as we're seeing in on-chain metrics too. 
right? We're seeing long-term holders continue to increase. We're seeing whales continue to incre net increase. These uptrends away from this general uh, line have been spurred by momentum of volume. And in here, even though we saw a decline in volume, what we did see is that uh, institutions were getting into the futures market. So this was a lot of derivatives pushing. What I think this is, is this is the baseline that the market is generally assuming upon. So somewhere above the 20K range. But once we get past the you know 40K range right now, we get into bubble territory, you get into mania. All right, now since we're going into risk off, the last people to capitulate are coming in here of anybody that thinks this is a tech trade, anybody that took it way up here, took it way up here. And we are seeing profit loss down on chain, showing us that it is indeed the weak hands and the paper hands that are giving up here. Now, it's not to say that we can't continue to dwindle down. Um, deflationary pressures are a different problem altogether if we have actual deflationary pressures. Right now, I don't think we're seeing a deflationary pressure. I think we are seeing uh, we are seeing confusion in the markets. Now, this is, again, still a high-risk area. If we fall down below this 40K, I would expect to go all the way back down to 30, quite frankly, because even though there's a lot of confluence in this area, we don't really have strong lines of support and resistance until we get back down to 30K, 29K. So keep an eye on that. Um, but in general, I think most of the online on-chain metrics are showing us that Bitcoin is going to continue to succeed. I think we're continuing to see countries uh, check my boxes on, you know, acknowledging it, accepting it. Uh, and we're going to see this as part of a de-dollarization trade. The, the biggest thing for me was seeing Iran uh, accept Bitcoin as an international trade currency. To me, that says we want to go back to using something that's not the dollar, like they used gold and stuff, uh, like they used it all through the 70s into the 80s. Um, but they lost gold in the 70s and 80s. So it's kind of interesting to see them go, oh, hey, what if we just have Bitcoin? We can't lose it in a plane flight on the way because the CIA catches it or some guy runs off with it, right? So this is an interesting way to settle their, their, uh, their opportunity here without the dollar. Now, uh, Ethereum, I'm still net bearish. I can't really find any reason to say that I'm bullish here. The on-chain metrics are not as strong as Bitcoin. We're seeing long-term holders uh, dwindling too. They think this is overvalued just as much as uh, other people think that Bitcoin's overvalued. So I would expect to return somewhere into the 23 range uh, for now. Um, until I see anything change on-chain or I see like better news, um, I think Bitcoin's going to start running the show again. I know that's controversial to some people uh, that they think that the altcoins are going to continue to dominate. But I think as we move into this risk period, we're going to see that monetary assets are going to become valuable again, as we've seen in my core hypothesis. Uh, ETH, Bitcoin. Overall, like I said, I think Bitcoin is going to continue to outperform, I think, uh, in the long term. We've had this area where we've kind of gone back and forth, but I think that we're just going to end up seeing a lot more of a slow grind on ETH until we get to some type of mania trend. I brought up ADA on Twitter uh, before and I, I did the little video. And from that video, <laughs> we've had a great time. Cool, up, got it. So um, called that one at a right point. Uh, glad I bought some. Uh, we are, if we set up support here, and we continue on moving up. We know that ADA acts as a counter ETH trade regardless of its performance. I know that on-chain is really good on ADA. Like truly and honestly, there's a lot of lockup going on. There was a lot of people collecting this and not selling it. So I think that we're going to continue to see ADA do well. Since I'm bearish on ETH, I would expect ADA to outperform ETH in terms of ADA to ETH. Now, that doesn't mean that ADA necessarily has to go up in dollar terms. But your total amount of, if you're long term a big better on Ethereum, this is a trade you can take to increase your ETH or Bitcoin holdings. So uh, gold. Right now, we haven't seen anything amazing yet. There, a lot of people were like, oh, gold is better on the day than the market. Yeah, okay, cool. That's because we weren't experiencing a deflationary event, so why would it matter? Gold was staying up because people are rotating into value, and some of the most undervalued stocks are gold stocks. So there's, you're going to start seeing that gold is going to start showing some signs of strength. We're seeing higher, higher lows, and we haven't seen a higher high since here, but I think generally we're going to start seeing that. We're going to start coming out of this tension zone. Um, but there could always be another drop off here and we could still be playing around in the sandbox. So until I get above eight, 1833, I, I'm just going to sit on the sidelines as a, okay, yep, cool. I've stacked all my physical on, on these plunges, which may, like, I, I don't know how lucky I got, but I stacked all my physical on every one of these four plunges and then a few more back here. 
like I just I got the dip very close so I'm very happy with that one so far uh, silver so my Wyckoff accumulation assumption on silver uh, silver was a big big news piece today too we hit our seasonal high we exceeded our seasonal high for a moment which means that uh, generally we are on track here still now I'm still expecting chop over and over and I expect that also this uptrend is a counter to this extreme downtrend so generally just a springing event but I think we'll probably continue along here and we'll find out if we're gonna get a massive deflationary crunch which I think would require that the market goes deflationary uh, the dollar becomes deflationary in terms of uh, panic response or we're gonna get this uh, bid up where we're gonna see a little bit of like a oh, nothing's happening but we're gonna see the volume change and this could be the transitional point where the volume is going up seeking buying up into the tops the more that it goes into buying its way up in volume the more signs that we're getting that we're accumulating and we're getting ready for liftoff we are seeing a lot of uh, trading activity in futures showing that people are taking these contracts they are receiving them uh, so it looks like the silver move is generally supported down here in copper we are still sideways now as an industrial metal it doesn't necessarily have to move up with everything else energy costs are going up and we could see a bullish pennant from here right like let's take it out log bullish pennant continuing I see us possibly breaking above this but I also drew out the scenario because the volume is declining that unless we see the volume pick up again this may not be a type of accumulation and we may just go down to this low again and that can happen even with gold and silver performing because copper isn't necessarily directly correlated as a monetary asset it's more correlated uh, to industry and energy costs so th this can be affected one way or another but for now these are the two plays that I'm watching for this to to work its way out so it's in the it's in the hold zone or the or the sit and wait zone uh, oil oh man I was mad at the gas pump today because <laughs> um, I was I was super happy just like a week ago and it was starting to see a downtrend and I really kind of told myself like hmm, we're probably gonna see a top in here nope we're going up so uh, I saw someone bring this up so this is not my TA oh man that's annoying uh, I that that plunge this fake little plunge that ever actually happened only happened on the futures market ruins everything I saw this brought up today on Twitter I'll see if I can pull this up the long-term trend here let's see if we can do it on log oh, it's so painful with that plunge because they're like oh it went below zero no it didn't uh, the long-term trend here shows us that we had this as resistance and generally this as support and so if we go up here <laughs> I know it's like the world's most bullish crypto style chart version of a uh, of uh, of oil but if we go up here I mean we could see 350 and I know that sounds insane um, but hear me out the world is insane and your money's trash uh, and as much as as much as there's some dollar bulls out there that are like that's ridiculous I'm gonna tell you that it's not uh, just simply on the basics of how the world's functioning the dollar doesn't have to die to get oil to $350 you just have to have enough of a inflationary crunch now how can you have a stock market crash with an inflationary crunch when people start losing their jobs contrary to popular belief not all consumer prices go down with deflation deflation affects a lot of liquid assets because people sell them off they also affect things like homes because people aren't buying but consumer prices like food and energy can go up why when you have a crash the producers slow down productivity because they're expecting lower prices in the future then they need to produce because it turns out the society needs more supply but there's a lot of people that are not working and so when you're not producing enough of said oil or you start shutting down factories due to defaults due to a deflationary spiral you now have a limitation in supply to a market that still needs it and so you can get an inflationary crunch during a deflationary spiral in terms of consumer prices so uh, overall it's possible to spike up here and then come back down and settle into a new high range and, and you know you had the 
the highs of the 1970s come down into the 80s and 90s and then work our way up. So the same concept. I am not going to say that the history will repeat perfectly, but look at this spike in the 70s. This was due to credit defaults in the South America and the companies shutting down. What happens if other producers shut down? It, it'll send us skyward. Now, I am not completely sold on that. This is just a good look at potential. Uh, so overall, I would stay bullish because we did make a higher high right here. I would stay bullish on oil until something changes. If we break down from here and go right back below and we come up and test and then start working our way sideways or just a slow grind, I wouldn't be so worried. But how do you protect yourself on your gas purchases if you're driving a gas vehicle like this? Well, one, if you drive a V8, uh, <laughs> like many people do, uh, like I do, uh, if you drive a V8, you might want to consider, just like what happened back here, that you should probably sell it before it gets bad. Now, if you're thinking of selling, okay. Now, you, you, can, you can get a more gas-efficient vehicle, sure. The other thing you can do is you can take out uh, long-term options contracts or futures contracts onto oil and counteract your cost of oil or purchase something that's going to outperform oil. Now, what's going to outperform $80 to $350? Whew, I don't know. Uh, maybe just bite the bullet for the spike and then get used to the higher prices. Uh, but one way or another, inflation is going to kick your butt. Uh, and so I think it's, it's probably going to work its way into oil in a rather surprising and painful way. Um, I, I know that's some super sad news today if, if you really like gas cars or uh, diesels, but uh, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't make the rules. I'm just guesstimate, guesstimating, and this is not fact anyways. Uh, this is just my assumptions. So uh, we look at the 10-year. Let's go back to the daily. Uh, the 10-year is up, right? And we're setting above the, uh, the highs up here. And we're getting into uh, the oh crap territory for the Fed. And I say that because I've said before, 1.85 was approximately our range where if we hold these prices, they're going to get nervous, right? Now, they might try to play chicken. Don't underestimate the ability of central banks to make bad decisions because <laughs> we have a long history of doing so. Uh, so yeah, if you see it going above 2% and they're still being hawkish, just start preparing by holding other assets that respond well in both deflationary and inflationary scenarios, such as gold. Uh, you can try and bet on silver, things like that. Um, but uh, this chaos is a little bit unnerving to a lot of people. And that's kind of the point. You have to be prepared. You have to have your insurance. And I, I, if you haven't bought it already, I would start purchasing your insurance just in case. But I'm not going to be a bear at the bottom. I'm going to say that I still think that we still get a blow off top and some assets. You have an opportunity to take that trade. But I wouldn't go all in because of the ability, inability to guess where the top is. Um, I find it's harder to call a top or a bottom than it is to identify a trend beginning and identify supply dynamics at the fundamental level. So uh, overall, the dollar made a tight little rebound here, but if we get a rejection from here, we're essentially rejecting off of we're essentially rejecting off of a long-term uh, trend line right in this area that obviously we've touched several times. See, we plunged here touched it several times before if we do reject off of it then good like we'll see the dollar continue to dwindle like it should uh, but this is the dxy against other currencies so just a reminder it doesn't uh it doesn't actually reflect inflation it is just the dollar against other currencies so it's really just showing trust in the dollar as a unit of account and expenditure against other currencies which are not doing so hot either uh, the federal funds rate um like i said and just for historic reference obviously um, we have had periods where, uh, it goes up, dot com crash, 07 housing crisis, uh, the 2018, um, 2018, uh, taper tantrum. And we go up here and we see this downtrend. We go up here and we go, oh, look at that. Uh, sorry. That looks a lot better. Look at that. We get a little blip right here. We're, we're staying in line with the trend and the market gives up here. So what do we have? The everything bubble pop. And just a reminder, the Federal Reserve hasn't tapered worth crap. So all the talk, none of the walk. So thanks for watching. Uh, leave comments and questions down below. Sorry if I sound tired. It was a very long day back at work. Um, but 
Uh, I hope to make these videos a little shorter. I hope it's as full of uh, as much information as possible. If you have any other questions, uh, feel free to ask down below. Like and subscribe.